The advantages of community solar. Welcome back to Text to Nation. I'm Fred Fishkin. Joining us from Solstice is co-founder and COO, Sandia Morali. Hi, Sandia. Hi, Fred. Great to be here. Pleasure to meet you. And let's start out with a, a little explanation, maybe, for the audience of what community solar is and the role Solstice is playing. Sure. So community solar is a way to go solar for people or businesses that can install rooftop solar panels. Either they don't have a suitable roof or they don't have the ability to pay for or finance panels. Community solar lets you subscribe with no upfront costs to a portion of a shared solar garden that sits in your community. Every month you receive credits on your utility bill for your for the power generated from your portion of the farm and you get to keep a percent of those a percentage of those credits as your monthly savings. So Solstice provides the entire customer facing experience so from initial customer enrollment to customer management services um, and we provide those services to the solar companies that own and operate these solar farms. So you have the solar companies that are building and financing these solar farms and we focus uh, focus on working with the communities and small businesses to enroll subscribers and manage them for the lifetime of their participation. And I guess people shouldn't confuse this with uh, an option that many have on their electricity bills uh, for green energy providers, things like that. This is totally different, right? This is, yeah, this is totally different. Um, in some states and some markets, you can layer the two on top of each other, um, but this really allows you to support uh, more clean energy flowing into your grid via local specific solar farm. And you get to save about 10 to 20% um, off of your electricity bill. And the numbers are pretty astounding when it comes to the percentage of, of people who really don't have the option of putting on the rooftop panels. Yeah, it's about four out of five households can't do rooftop solar. And there's a variety of reasons. Like I mentioned a couple earlier, maybe you live in an apartment or you don't own your roof. So you really can't make that decision to go solar on your roof or your roof faces the wrong way and isn't really suitable for for solar panels. Um, and that upfront investment, either you need to have the, the cash to be able to pay for it, or you need to be able, you have good credit to finance a system. And a lot of people don't have that, that financing capability. So there are a lot of reasons um, why rooftop panels aren't going to work for, for homes or for small businesses um, or even larger businesses. And community solar really can be an option for, for all those folks. For instance, uh, and full disclosure here, I'm surrounded by trees where I live in, in, a, in a house, and uh, uh, I've become a customer of Solstice through a solar farm the company is working with in New Jersey. Which states are you working in, in now, Sanja? Yeah, so New Jersey obviously is one of our states. We started our work in Massachusetts, um, and so we're active here uh, in Massachusetts, which is where I'm located. And then we also have a pretty deep presence in New York and Illinois and Minnesota and soon to be in New Mexico, which is a new market. I um, mean, we've got our eyes on some other states, too, but those are, are the states that we're currently active in. So tell us about the, the challenges facing Solstice and uh, other community solar projects as well. What, what are the obstacles that you work on overcoming, I guess, every day to, to make this grow? Yeah. So from our perspective, you know, we're focused on getting as many people enrolled into these projects as possible. And it's a fairly new model for people to, to go to go green. And a lot of what we face is that kind of initial skepticism. This sounds too good to be true. I don't have to pay anything to sign up for this. And then I magically get these these bill credits on my utility bill. Um, and so it sounds a bit too good to be true. Uh, and so we really work to provide an educational sales experience for customers and sort of explain what community solar is, why it's possible, and weave that throughout all parts of the customer journey. And it's also why we work with local communities, municipalities, and kind of deliver the message through through these trusted trusted channels. So that's one one challenge that we faced on the customer side. Um, I'd say one other challenge is just community solar is new. Um, there are a lot of states that are developing programs for the first time. And like with anything new, there's a lot to figure out from the developers that are building these projects, the utilities that have to be part of the management of these projects, um, program administrators and regulators. And so 
a lot of times we're nav navigating uh, setting up these programs together and, and what we've done to address maybe some of those uncertainties or just lack of clarity in these programs is make sure we're building relationships with all of those stakeholders, you know, asking questions to make sure that, you know, our job is to deliver a really great customer experience and we want to make sure we have all the information um, to be able to do that. So we really focus on that when these programs start getting uh, built out. Tell us about the different uh, government efforts to promote this. I know the EPA is involved as well, right? Yeah, uh, community solar programs are really set up on a state by state basis. So states will pass legislation that creates uh, allows for community solar and then a program will be designed. And there are some federal incentives um, that support these programs. The uh, the investment tax credit supports the the build out of the solar farms. Under the Inflation Reduction Act, there are some additional incentives that are available, especially if you're building projects for low moderate income families or cited in energy justice communities. Um, and so there are some federal incentives that are able to support these projects, but really the, the programs and the policies are driven at the state level. Um, and so there are the programs are designed in different ways, but it all, um, you know, they're all trying to achieve building more of these projects to ensure that a broader group of people can participate in this clean energy transition. Might things like uh, battery storage uh, play a role here? And I guess when people have uh, an EV, uh, that has to be figured into the equation here in terms of the amount of uh, electricity or energy they'll be using? Yeah, so when we sign people up for these projects, we look at their historical energy usage and size their portion of the solar farm based on their historical energy usage. So when you went through our enrollment process, we looked at your bill, you used a certain amount of electricity over the last year, and so we gave you, allocated you a portion of the solar garden that would be comparable to how much you you used over the past year. So of course, if you have an EV, um, you're going to be using consuming more electricity, you know, a larger house presumably will will use more electricity. So we'll size people's allocations in these solar farms appropriately. Um, battery storage, in general, there are additional there are, I think, increasingly incentives to have solar coupled with storage, which just helps overall resiliency of the grid. And so that's more kind of at the project level, what developers are looking at and, and how to make their projects economic. And in some states like California, I think storage will be required with every community solar project. So there are definitely some um, state level incentives and mandates really that are that are going to increase battery storage. Well, tell us what you're anticipating in terms of expansion, growth for you and, and the industry over this yeah. coming year for this coming year i think you know we uh it's personally at solstice we're very excited about launching in new mexico that's a new market it has um you know been mo moving a little slower than expected but i i think we'll be kind of formally and fully launched later this year and and that will be a, a fairly big market for us um so new mexico is exciting it has a very high low moderate income requirements. So half of all of the projects will be going to LMI households, which is really exciting. It just means the impact can go um, can go a bit further uh, across many more people. And we're also excited about growing more deeply in Illinois and New York, which are our two largest markets. We we have a lot of growth opportunities there, um, which is great because we we've been quite successful in, in enrolling customers in both of those markets. And then you know can't forget New Jersey. There the permanent program applications. Um, just wrapped up at the end of last year and, and developers are starting to get awarded now. Um, so we're excited to grow our footprint in New Jersey. That's my home state. So I'd love to do do more in, in New Jersey. Um, and I think that'll be on the radar for this year too. Very exciting. For more information, where's the best place for people to go? They can come to our website at www.solstice.us. We do have some space available on our Tom's River project, which is the one that you're enrolled for. And so if folks want to sign up right now and they're in the JC PL territory um, around the Tom's River area, uh, we, we should have spots available. Terrific. The website is solstice.us. 
Sandhya Morali, thank you so much for spending time with us. Thanks so much, Fred, for having me.